the times. So um, we'll kick it off. Thank you and hello everybody. Uh, I appreciate your coming. This is the third uh, Russell Sage uh, Institute, Summer Institute for Journalists, the first and possibly the last, I don't know, to be virtual rather than in person. Uh, previous editions of this, we've gathered people in New York. We're doing this uh, three afternoons in a row um, at the same time, two o'clock to 3.30. Um, and each day has a different central topic. Uh, today's topic is the pandemic. Tomorrow's topic is race in America. And Thursday's topic is uh, the economy and the Biden administration's economic program. And we have wonderful guests uh, for all three. Um, our purpose here is to give uh, a, a high level briefing on what we would judge to be the three biggest stories likely to take us through the next year. Um, and also to work in a little bit about uh, the relationship between uh, journalism and social science. Uh, Russell Sage Foundation is in the social science business. Um, although I'm a journalist, most of my colleagues there are, are social scientists. Um, so what you'll see a slip in little uh, elements of that during this session. Um, logistics, uh, the main thing is I I'm going to be asking questions to our two um, major panelists. Um, and if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A box, which is on the bottom of the screen, kind of to the right. Um, and then they'll get sent to me. And toward the end of the session, I'll start asking questions that people have, have put into the box. Um, so I, I'll just briefly introduce our participants and then just get into things. Um, Wafel Sader is my colleague at Columbia and uh, where she is a university professor. She's a medical doctor uh, who also holds a public policy degree and uh, I would say one of the world's leading researchers and practitioners of public health. Um, for most of the 21st century, uh, she's been building up um, a very large and ambitious uh, institute at Columbia called ICAP, um, which offers HIV, AIDS, and other disease uh, treatment at the front lines in, you know, always more than 20 countries um, all over the world, principally, I guess, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and uh, in addition to that, uh, Wafa has a lot of things that she does, but one of the many is that she's been one of the central people managing Columbia University's response to the pandemic, uh, which our provost uh, initially called the biggest crisis in 250 year history of Columbia University, um, and uh, is frequently quoted in the press uh, and, and uh, is one of the leading voices in communicating to the public through journalists how to think about all this. So um, I have a bunch of things to ask both of you. Uh, and well, before I, I'll introduce David briefly and then I won't have to introduce him later. Uh, almost everybody on this uh, show will recognize David as the person who you start your day with because he writes um, the New York Times newsletter, which often has scientific and social science content. Um, he uh, has been at the Times for years in a variety of positions, including economics columnist, um, Washington bureau chief, uh, founder of the Upshot, and um, I guess he was the head or co-head or something of the famous Digital Future Commission that um, turned the times from a sinking print operation to a thriving digital one. Um, okay, so Wafa, I guess I'll start by being prospective and then 
become retrospective and then become prospective again. Um, where are we? Um, uh, well, I'll just I'll just stop there for now. And and um, in my own personal life, things are starting to feel oddly normal, like I'm hugging people and things like that. Um, and and I go out and I forget to put my mask in my pocket. But is that just me or are things looking up? Uh, uh, thank you, first of all, Nick, for, uh, sure. for the opportunity and to be today with all of you and with you, David, specifically. Um, I think we're, I would say, in terms of the COVID-19 pandemic at a very tenuous moment um, uh, overall. Um, I think it really depends where you are. Uh, in terms of um, how our perceptions of the COVID-19 pandemic. And um, so I think, for example, if you are in New York City, in particular New York State, or in several parts of the United States at this point in time, uh, there's this uh, feeling of optimism, a feeling of return to normalcy, a feeling of letting go of many of the restrictions that we've struggled all of us with over the past uh, year and a half. Uh, but I think on the other hand, it is a tenuous moment because we know um, that um, uh, this pandemic is not done. Um, it's still there. Uh, and we probably have no chance of eliminating or eradicating this virus anytime soon. Uh, we have pockets so long as, we, I believe that so long as we have pockets of individuals who are not vaccinated, uh, so long as we have continued transmission uh, amongst unvaccinated as well as vaccinated people of the virus, particularly these new variants that may be more transmissible, may be less susceptible to our vaccines. And uh, in the context of a lot more mixing, a lot more travel, and also uh, all the easing of the restrictions, we are going to see uh, surges occurring uh, now and then. And of course, we have to keep in mind that uh, we're, the United States is not an island. Um, we are uh, you know, connected to a world where there's, ha there's been really um, almost a scandalous lack of access to vaccines in many of the countries where ICAP works. My own teams have had trouble accessing vaccines and most of the populations of the world have not, uh, don't have a chance of getting vaccinated. So, um, and of course that means in an interconnected world now, we are vulnerable. Um, I always say so long as COVID anywhere, uh, COVID in any place is COVID everywhere. And I think that's the reason why, while there's a sense of optimism, I think we need to remain vigilant and, and, and also be pragmatic and realize that we're not out of the woods. We're gonna to continue to see uh, probably surges over the next several months. In the United States, it seems as if, and correct me if I'm wrong, we don't have a major problem at this moment with vaccine availability, but we do have a major problem with vaccine hesitancy. Is, is vaccine hesitancy a phenomenon globally or is it particularly in the United States? Vaccine hesitancy sadly now is a global phenomenon um, in, in almost every country around the world, some more than others. And certainly in the US there's been a long history of vaccine anti-vaxxers, anti-vaxxer movement, as well as vaccine hesitancy for a variety of different reasons. Uh, but it is not solely a, a, a rich country phenomenon. It's not solely a US phenomenon. We see it all over the world at, this, at the present time. And, um, and it is something that uh, in addition to vaccine access, it's, it's also vaccine hesitancy as how, and how can we overcome vaccine hesitancy and reluctance and build vaccine confidence, not just in our own country, but around the world. So it's an ongoing, ongoing struggle. Um, and I feel like the, the, the probably the narrative about COVID-19 in many ways uh, maybe needs to change in, um, in a, in a, into a much more of a, a global and maybe a more realistic narrative where we, we anticipate we're prepared for um, a time when we may need to, again, put back in place some of the restrictions uh, even amongst people who are vaccinated or in areas where there's a highly vaccinated populations uh, because of this interconnectedness and so on. So um, rather than sort of people believing that we're gonna come to one day, one moment in time when this is behind us uh, to sort of move to more of a narrative of we're gonna have to live with this virus, be able to prevent severe illness 
uh, largely through vaccination, uh, but, con but continue that we will continue to see cases of COVID-19. Well, there's so many questions that I have. I, I want to sort of limit myself somewhat before going to David, but just a few. Would it be fair to say that you would not be as worried about the incidence or the infection rate of COVID-19 because of your faith in the vaccines so that if we're journalists covering it, we should really focus on vaccinations and severe illness, not on infection rates, or am I pushing that too far? I think you're right on target. That's the, I think that is the new narrative is that to, to really uh, push on the idea that uh, vaccines are now our, our, our main goal and they're our main protectors and the, our purpose now is to prevent severe illness and deaths uh, from this virus, not to uh, really aim at all for prevention of infections. So I think, and that's, I think, requires a change in terms of uh, looking at the data, interpreting the data, and also disseminating this new narrative, which I think is, is very vital, uh, so that also that people appreciate the value of vaccines, but importantly, that this, they avoid, this avoids the panic uh, that could ensue as we might see increasing in increasing numbers of cases as we are experiencing in several parts of the country now. And let me just ask you also about um, these two problems of vaccine availability and vaccine hesitancy. These are huge questions, obviously, but just a few thoughts on first, globally, what do we do about the lack of vaccine availability? I think there are several things that must be done, and I, I can't stress how how urgent this is. Um, I, I feel like thus far, what what has been done has been really a drop in the bucket through these donations, the variety either donations of funds or the donations of very limited numbers of doses. I mean, ultimately, we need to vaccinate, uh, get vaccines to eight billion people globally, and the donations thus far are don't are, are hardly making a dent in terms of uh, uptake and coverage of vaccines. There are three ways. I think the first one is the f what we need to do now. And I always think that uh, what can be done most urgently and, and the only way we can deal with this most urgently is to for the US and other wealthy countries to invest, put the resources in production of more, more vaccines. And that means uh, the vaccines that we have now, either through uh, funding of the companies that are producing vaccines now in the US to increase their production or uh, to build new facilities rapidly to be able to produce more vaccines for the world, doses for the world. So that's number one. And that's the probably the most urgent, uh, mm -hmm. you know, first, uh, first step. I think the second is, uh, is to work on the process of trying transfer of technology. And this gets at uh, trying to bring the technology, particularly the technology of the mRNA vaccines, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine technology, to other parts of the world where there is experience in producing vaccines. Uh, for example, countries like uh, India, South Africa, Egypt, uh, other countries around the world that have a history of being able to produce vaccines and uh, force or uh, entice or incentivize the companies uh, in, to, to be able to transfer technology, do the training and enable these countries to essentially be hubs for producing vaccines uh, for the world. But that will take more time. And thirdly, the effort around um, the patents and trying to deal with some of the restrictions on the patents and so on. But that is much more of a longer term kind of an effort. So I feel like most urgently now is really to put the funds and the resources to produce more of vaccines uh, by the companies that have already been able to produce these vaccines. They've demonstrated capacity to do it. Uh, I cannot tell you how urgent this is. I was last month, I was in two countries in Africa. I was in Mozambique. I was in Iswatini, formerly Swaziland. And it was quite an uncomfortable situation for me personally, because I am fully vaccinated. I'm one of those fortunate people. Uh, but the people I interacted with, including my own teams in country, don't have not had access to vaccines at all. Um, so uh, there's this huge disparity that exists at this moment in time when places like the United States, where we actually have an overabundance of vaccines and vaccine doses and other parts of the world that have uh, no, no, vaccine, no vaccines at all. It's in some ways, it's reminiscent to me of uh, 
the motivation for establishing ICAP more than almost now two decades ago, which was this disparity in access to HIV treatment, uh, where people in wealthy countries could get access to life-saving treatments while uh, in other places of the world, they have no chance of, or any hope of getting treatment. So uh, this is a crisis. And, um, and I think it, it is something that I, I always hope that um, the media in particular um, can champion this and, and not, not be satisfied, I think, by the announcements of uh, donations every now and then. Um, and let me just ask you one question about vaccine hesitancy, which I know is a huge topic. And then I want to ask David a couple of questions. And, and, and so um, those who are watching don't know, but uh, I guess it was three years ago, I, I spent a week or 10 days with Wafa in Africa in Tanzania um, as a non-doctor. Uh, my impression was it wasn't just that you were making HIV AIDS treatments available to people who hadn't had it. It was also that, you know, if you built a shiny new HIV AIDS treatment in Dar es Salaam and announced that it was open, that wouldn't necessarily solve the problem. So in a sense, that's a variation on the vaccine hesitancy problem. It's, it's you need to have the weight to address the disease scientifically, and then you have to wait to have to have a way to persuade people to make use of it. Often people in very distressed uh, circumstances. I, I was able to tell my children, and this is you know actually true, that I've, I, I've, when I got back that I've never spent as much time in brothels as I did with you. Um, <laughs> in fact, I never spent any time in brothels until I did with you. So, so based on a lot of experience meeting the challenge of getting people to accept medical services that would help them, where does this hesitancy come from and what works to break through it? Yeah, it's interesting. And uh, I think sometimes it, it's rooted in, in, uh, in history. Uh, sometimes it's rooted in, in history. Sometimes it's rooted in also um, in misinformation, disinformation um, as another uh, source of hesitancy. And sometimes it's simply, you know, kind of lack of information. Um, it could be um, as well. Um, and, and I think uh, in a lot of ways is, is uh, the goal is to, if you try to overcome these, the goal is to how do we provide the correct information to the people who need to have this information in hand, but that's not sufficient. We always know that knowledge is insufficient. And what you do is you need to really work to change behaviors and, and, to, build, and to build trust. And that's the tough work is how do we build trust? How do we change behaviors? And as you saw in Tanzania through our work, um, Nick, is uh, you have to work with the people, the, the, I call them the recipients of care, that is the stakeholders themselves, whether they be the organizations of uh, sex workers or whether it be the organizations of people who inject drugs or uh, whoever it might be, or religious organizations, you need to go to them and problem solve with them and ask them how, what is the best way uh, to be able to reach their constituency, to be able to reach their peers. And that's the hard work um, that has to be done and must be done, whether it be in, in the US, uh, particularly because there's a lot of history of mistrust of research, mistrust of the medical establishment. It is very hard work, but it's absolutely fundamental. You really start by engaging um, these constituencies in a very honest conversation about what they be, what they believe and why they believe it, and then try to identify the champions that will help you reach those uh, those individuals. And uh, you will recall that we went and visited, for example, uh, a community-based organization that was working with Tanzania with a very disenfranchised group of individuals, uh, men who have sex with men, and and people who inject drugs, for example, and, and working hand in hand with such an organization, then you're able to reach the people that they know best how to reach. Um, so that's the hard work that needs to, to happen. And it takes time and it takes patience, uh, but, it's, uh, but you, can't, uh, you can't find a shortcut around, around doing this. It's, it's so fundamental to trying to achieve what we all want to achieve uh, in public health overall. <laughs> 
But there are uh, examples you can point to um, that are, you know, perhaps more than merely anecdotal of successes either in the U.S. or outside the U.S. in overcoming vaccine hesitancy. Yes, um, there are. Um, um, actually, there's some, there have been some research that has been done looking at this. And uh, for example, there's been research done to to try to um, identify like what's the right message uh, for people who are hesitant. Is it uh, providing information on the vaccine themselves, how good they are, how safe they are, whatever, how valuable they are, uh, or is it using other messages? And like in one study, in a very well-conducted study that was done in the UK, um, they found that actually for people who are more hesitant, it was highlighting the individual, what the person individually would get out of the vaccine, rather than when we think as public health people, we think of the kind of community benefit, the benefit for the society, the benefit of the community. So it was much more of a focus on an individual and the benefits they will gain. And they found that that was uh, using such a message was actually much more successful than trying the traditional uh, public health messaging around the value of vaccines overall. So mm -hmm. that's one example with data that shows that you can, you, you know, and, and we and others have studied some of these issues and we need to keep looking for these data. And then if something works, scale it up. If it doesn't work, we should, put it aside and try something else. Um, David, let me move to you and, and ask uh, some questions about uh, being a journalist during all this. Um, if you were to sort of say notionally, you know, there's a lot of people out there, it's hard to believe if you're a journalist who aren't journalists and who think journalists don't really perform a very useful function. But it seems to me even those people would have to yield in the case of a pandemic and say, here's a situation where uh, journalism, good journalism is really needed um, because public information, as Wafa just said, is so Im vitally important. And it's really a matter of life and death. Um, so how did you and your colleagues at the New York Times think about handling this challenge and how would you sort of grade yourselves on, on how, how you've done so far? Uh, hello, everybody, first of all. Um, uh, I, I would maybe separate us into a couple of different groups. Um, uh, so I think that if you uh, work for a large news organization like the New York Times um, uh, and a handful of others, there are a lot of people who are experts um, in a given in a given area. They're journalistic experts. They don't have PhDs, but but they still have real expertise. I think one of the reasons the Daily has been such a success for the Times um, is that it's allowed our very large number of journalists who have some expertise to to use that expertise in a way outside of stories. You just get to listen to them talk. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know we can all think of examples at other places. Nina Totenberg at NPR, in some ways, is the canonical example of a journalist who has developed expertise from years of covering a beat. And so. Um, over time, what happens is um, the, the spotlight shines on different, um, different beats at different times. And for my colleagues who have covered infectious diseases for years or decades, for them, um, this is the time when the spotlight came and found them. And I think we've all been enormously fortunate to, to benefit from their accumulated knowledge and their accumulated contacts, right? With They, they interview people like Wafa, um, they know who to go to to understand this stuff. And so I think for that group of people, which is a tiny percentage of journalists at the New York Times, but they've provided a, a, obviously a disproportionate share of our coverage. This is the moment. Um, I, you know, I had a version of this moment during the financial crisis of 2008. I'm an economics writer um, by training, such as journalistic training is, and so um, I felt like this was an opportunity for me to 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 write about a lot of things I've been learning about. And, and for science journalists, I think I think it's similar. For the rest of us, it's very different. And what you see is you see huge numbers of people um, basically running to where the story is in a way that I think is productive. Um, uh, so, you know, we had a reporter, Mitch Smith, who, who basically made it his, his, he became an expert in gathering COVID data and, and analyzing it. His background wasn't in doing that, 
Um, but thank goodness he did it. We had graphics editors who did similar things. Um, I, I'd always, um, there was a part of me that was always intrigued by the idea of being a public health reporter. It has some overlap with economics. You get a chance to tell human stories. You get a chance to use numbers, but I'd never been a public health reporter. Um, and to some extent, um, uh, hundreds of journalists have had to turn themselves into that. And so I think, I think there are a whole bunch of ways in which the media has done a good job. You look at the data that the Atlantic um, has gathered or the data that the New York Times has gathered. Um, that isn't just sitting on a shelf somewhere. Journalists had to gather that and, and allow people to see the, the trends. Um, um, you look at the explanatory job that journalists have, have done. There are many academic researchers in public health and in other areas who are not as good at WAFA as speaking to a lay audience. And it's sort of been our job to translate what they are saying. Sometimes that's hard. Sometimes you have to say to someone three and four times, I'm sorry, can you explain that again? <laughs> can you explain it again in a way that someone who doesn't have a PhD could understand? Um, I also think fairly early on, not early enough, but fairly early on journalists covering this were able to try to help explain to people just how serious um, this had the potential to be. Um, uh, and then I think there are some areas where, um, uh, where the media in general, we have not done as good a job as we might. I think once we grasped how serious this was, um, we did a good job at conveying that seriousness to readers. I don't always think we have done a, as good of a job of putting some of the better news in perspective. So I think a lot of the early vaccine coverage by the media, and I'm, I'll just talk generally about the media rather than kind of, you know, I think in some of these areas, the Times, um, I would argue maybe ha has actually done fine, but I'm just, I'll just talk about it generally. Um, uh, I think, you know, in some, in some areas, we were too negative about the vaccines early on. I still remember reading a story about the AstraZeneca results in Europe and scratching my head and saying, wait a second, the headline is that it's 80 something percent effective, but I read the story and not a single person in the study uh, was hospitalized or died. Um, that sure sounds like a lot closer to 100% effectiveness. And, and I understand why the technical idea is not 100%, but, but we, we haven't always done a good job of helping people understand the context of good news and bad news. There's a good study out of Dartmouth um, with uh, three authors, uh, one of whom is named Bruce Sacerdote. I've written about it if you want to look it up. And, and he, they basically found substantial bad news bias among national US publications. When cases were rising, we said cases are rising. When they were falling, we paid a lot of attention to the regions where they were rising, or we told you why they might soon rise again. And that's not false, but it doesn't give readers as good of a perspective as, as I think we, we might have done. Um, well, let me ask Wafa, and then I want to return to, to David and or both of you. Um, as, as somebody who's frequently getting calls from the press, um, what's your sense of you know, how good a job people have done, what annoys you when journalists call you? Um, how do you feel about our collective performance during this crisis? Uh, well, I mean, I, I agree with David. It's, it's very hard to generalize on journalists overall. You know, there's just such a, I mean, my, my experience is that there's such a huge diversity and variability in terms of the um, the person who's calling and in terms of their level of, of knowledge, uh, just basic, as you were saying, David, just kind of what their background is and whether they've been in this space before or not, or whether they're completely naive to uh, this whole area of health or public health. And I think that often very much reflects on the questions they ask and, and, and sort of the explanations they need, but that's fine. That's not an issue. Um, I do think that I, I sometimes when I think or maybe in the future when hopefully this is behind us at some point, is that um, uh, this, one of the silver linings of COVID-19 is, um, is I think an increase in public health literacy um, that's really palpable uh, amongst the media, I would say, amongst the journalists who call me among, uh, in just reading the reporting that's happening in, the, in newspapers and magazines and so on, or on the web, just the depths and the transformation in terms of public health literacy is, is pretty amazing. Um, 
And I think that's also been helpful in another silver lining is, is that this is much, it's gone much broader now to the population overall. And I believe that, again, that there's a much more of an appreciation of public health, what it means and this literacy, this ability to understand and think about data and be able to look at a figure and see uh, that the trend is going up or the trend is going down or look at a map and see where more cases and less cases. This is not simple. This is um, and I and I this is important, and I think it, it's a very valuable um, uh, level of information literacy that I think bodes well for us moving forward. So I think that in and of itself is a is a great service that I think many um, journalists has have really been very important in in really disseminating more information and building this the the the, the literacy of the public around uh, public health and around COVID. And certainly the New York Times has been one of them, a remarkable ability to the collect data, digest data, visualize data is, is remarkable. And, um, and I think that's, um, that's, a, that's a very important uh, value. I think the one area is maybe um, that I would say would be um, something that I think could have been done better is kind of thinking ahead a bit, you know, is, is being a little bit ahead of the curve. Like, you know, we kind of, I always feel like we we knew vaccines were gonna come, and they're gonna happen. I mean, we, we knew that creating vaccines against this virus, is not gonna be like trying to develop a, an HIV vaccine where we've been trying for decades without success. Everybody knew that this is gonna be doable, um, but yet we didn't really uh, think about vaccine hesitancy, for example and uh, early on and talk about, anticipate, uh, anticipate what we need to prepare and think about that and motivate and talk and write about it in terms of how do we make vaccines accessible? How do we make them available? How do we get people to accept them and start that early work? And I feel that that's a missed opportunity to kind of think about what's happening, what's gonna happen next, what's on the horizon in terms of the pandemic. And now again, like the idea of, um, and and um, and 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 be and sort of stay with the story as an important piece and stay with it um, as as a valuable uh, important thing moving forward. The, similarly, now I feel the narrative uh, it now should be about that trajectory. What is the narrative from now onwards in terms of this uh, this this pandemic and how should we be thinking? How should we all of us be thinking about it? That people think about it and how um, so that they can cope better, be prepared better, and so on. So uh, these are some of the finer points. I actually think in, in, that's a fascinating point that I, it intersects with my point in a way that had not occurred to me until you just made it, which is if, as you said, the, we knew the vaccines were coming, and even if we didn't know exactly when, that could have been an opportunity for journalists to sort of um, study up a little bit. Okay, yeah. what is going to be the challenge? Th there is this. There are these technical measures of how effective they are, and they matter. Those technical measures matter. But what we really need to figure out is um, uh, what will those measures say and what will they not say, right? And, and I think yeah. if we had spent a little bit more time with that, instead of just repeating the numbers that came out of scientific trials, mm -hmm. which experts mm -hmm. understand, but ordinary people don't, we might have thought, wait a second, that's not the only number that matters, right? There are also yeah. these other measures. And we could have anticipated the hesitancy. I mean, the political environment was telling us that uh, there was a, a portion of the population anti-mask, right? And masking, and uh, obviously they are gonna be anti-vaccine. You know, it's kind of would have helped us in, in planning a, a bit better. And, you know, this focus uh, around the how, the how do you get from here to there? You have a vaccine that's fantastic, that works, but then the how is the tough part. How do you get that vaccine to the people who need to get vaccinated? Yeah. Um, let me raise another couple of press related questions. In addition to everything we've been talking about, Another thing that's you know eternally difficult for the press because of various things about how journalism is structured, uh, and that you saw sometimes in this instance is the kind of um, uh, situations where there's not a clear right answer. The classic example or a classic example is the reopening schools debate. Um, so how do we as journalists report on vaccines are easy, masks are easy because, you know, everybody should get vaccinated, everybody should wear masks. But, uh, but 
should schools reopen, you had a, a genuine argument, you know, with, with both sides seeming to have kind of people that journalists find sympathetic on them. How do, how do we do things like that in journalism? How should we? How have we? I think it's hard. I mean, I think I do think that's a case where part of our job is to reflect um, the cacophony, right? And and make clear that um, there are things we don't know. I mean, early on, we really didn't know how dangerous schools were. Um, and I think, look, I, I think that um, while it's not, while schools don't seem to have been major sources of outbreak, um, schools Schools still were, um, there was real danger for teachers if we had simply left schools open, right? I mean, there were, there were real trade-offs here. I think the dangers are minute once people are vaccinated, but for much of last year, people weren't vaccinated, right? And so um, uh, I, I, think it's, uh, I think this was a really, really hard call. I, I, my guess is when we look back in retrospect, we'll decide that we were too aggressive in shutting schools, but I don't think it's gonna be clear that um, we should have just left schools open. There was a lot we didn't know about this virus and it really would have subjected teachers to um, increased risk before the vaccines were available. And so I think this is one of these cases in which um, some of the basic rules, we should be honest about what we don't know, which sometimes journalists we struggle with a little bit. Um, we, we have, um, Nick, if you can come up with a way to describe this, I would love it because I'm confident this idea is right, but I've never come up with a good way to describe it. We journalists are quite comfortable with stories that are either 0%, 100%, either 0%, 50%, or 100%. We're comfortable with all those, right? And so I'll give you an example. For a while, too long, we covered global warming as a 50% story, right? Um, uh, I think many publications have now moved it to a hundred percent story. There's obviously uncertainty about global warming, but we treat it as it's happening. You know, when there's a fight about whether inflation is going to keep rising or not, we cover it appropriately. I think like a 50% story. Um, it might, it might not. Um, we really struggle with stories that are 80% stories or 10% stories and saying there is uncertainty. We are not sure but the two outcomes are not equally likely. Um, and I think, I think if you sort of think about schools, I think with some stuff with schools, it actually was a 50% story. And then I think over time, um, it shifted a little bit. And I think there are some risks with reopening schools, but they seem to be quite modest. And so the schools issue is really hard. I think in, to some extent, not pretending like there is some truth that we could have gotten to a year ago if only we tried hard enough is the right approach. Well, so yeah, this opens up a whole Sorry. bunch of interesting stuff. Um, yeah. Well, go ahead, Wafa, and then I'll come in after you. Yeah, no, no, just building on what David said, I think it's something that public health we and, and physicians and public health practitioners have struggled with is this, this whole idea of risk. And I think it's such a complex issue of explaining to, to people the magnitude of risk and what risk means. And, um, and I think that's really at the root of, everything around this pandemic. It's about weighing the risks, uh, whether it's the risk of uh, opening schools versus closing schools, whether it's the, and what it, and the risk for various constituencies, obviously, teachers, students, et cetera, parents. And then the same thing applies to vaccines and, and transmitting the whole issue of the risk benefits and the, the risk of a, a remote a rare side effect versus the, in, the benefits of a vaccine. I think that whole area of communicating around risk is at the core of public health communications, and it's something that I, I think we we haven't we 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 struggled with uh, as well. And and probably one of the uh, of the challenges with communication around this pandemic has been, um, you know, I, I feel like with with a pandemic that's evolving. You always have to situate your comments in what I know today, what the evidence says today. And you have to remind the audience every day that this is what we know today. Tomorrow, we may have different evidence evolving, which will change the story, which will change the recommendation tomorrow. And that's very difficult for people to, to feel comfortable. It doesn't sit well with people to be in this very uncertain uh, situation. So a few things about this. I mean, this gets into the guts of sort of journalistic practice and how to make it better. Uh, you know, if if when I was starting out uh, a long time ago, I think the average person in the newsroom 
and I would say, given the time I'm talking about, I would say the average guy in the newsroom, because they were almost all guys. If you said to, you know, I'm dealing with a very complex, evolving scientific situation, uh, what do I do? Uh, the, the guy in the newsroom would say, well, that's not what we do as journalists. You know, we, we don't evaluate things in that way. We, we don't evaluate those, that technical evidence. We find an expert, call the expert, quote the expert. Um, and if there's disagreement, find one expert on one side, the other expert on the other side, quote them both as equivalent. You know, the famous both sidesism. And I feel like our profession is evolving slowly beyond that, but we haven't quite figured it out. One thing that, you know, is useful to journalists, and this goes back to what David was saying about 100% and 0%. Um, Boafa and I have a colleague at Columbia named Jonathan Cole, and uh, who's a sociologist, and, and he came to a class I was teaching once and said something to the journalists in the class that I thought was extremely useful and kind of a light bulb moment for a journalist. And what he said was, anything that's settled, experts and scholars by definition do not study it. It's not interesting to them if it's settled. So um, someone who is a high-end top level expert is always gonna be spending their time uh, studying things that are intensely in dispute. And what scholars and experts do is essentially in a sort of juried and curated way, argue with each other about things that aren't settled. Um, and, and that really runs against at least the old school journalism understanding about expertise, which is that it doesn't involve disputation, it involves certainty. Um, and if, if you can, understand that as a journalist, it's, it's helpful in helping you kind of negotiate the world of, you know, questions like what expert should I call? And what kind of question should I ask that expert? And dealing in degrees of certainty and questions around what's settled and what's in dispute still or evolving. Um, but that, that doesn't come naturally to at least journalists of my generation, it has to be learned. And I agree with you on both ends of that, but it is something that journalists historically were not comfortable doing, and um, or many, and that increasingly, I think we have to be, because um, uh, the, the there are, although I said that many academics are not that good at speaking to lay people, there are some, right? And, and, and it's a, one of the wonderful things is that there are, is now the flowering of, of, you know, originally blogs and social media presences and others. And so there are experts out there who can um, often explain things for people. And if we as journalists, especially at publications that think that we're offering something valuable enough to ask people to give us money for it, um, if we think that we're just going to be stenographers, um, that's not that valuable, right? And, and, and not only that, but it's often a little bit, um, it's a little bit false, meaning you're usually making judgments whether you realize it or not, right? Which expert are you going to call, right? Um, uh, when are you going to decide something deserves um, the both sides treatment, which some stories do, right? Particularly stories trying to predict what's going to happen next. And when are you going to decide, no, the both sides treatment is actually misrepresenting reality. And so um, the, one of the things that the pandemic has reminded me of a little bit is um, uh, that logic is an underrated tool, um, uh, it, certainly for journalists. And it, it, I, my guess is it extends beyond journalism. And I recognize someone is probably saying, well, wait a second, logic can get you in trouble, right? Some things about the COVID virus are not logical. That's true. Logic is not a perfect tool. Um, but I mentioned the financial crisis before. And when I looked back and tried to be self-evaluative and critical after the financial crisis, I felt really good about my coverage of the housing bubble with a colleague of mine, Matoko Rich, who's now our Tokyo bureau chief and is covering the Olympics. Um, Matoko and I together wrote story after story that ran on the front page of the New York Times talking about how by any historical measure, housing prices were, were out of whack. Um, uh, and um, uh, we wrote one where we pointed out there were many regions where they weren't out of whack. 
um, which I sort of regret, um, even though I think it was accurate at the time. But most of our stories were basically saying in huge parts of the country, it's out of whack. At, at one of my high school reunions, someone who's a real estate agent came up to me and started yelling at me for, for, for those stories. I felt good about those. I did not do a good job covering the, the securitization of mortgages before it happened. And as I looked back on that and thought, why didn't I see just how dangerous that was? I realized that I'd done a few interviews that touched on it, but whenever I ran into someone on Wall Street who would explain to me why it was okay, I kind of gave up and I deferred to them. I figured they know more about this than I do. They have money at stake they must be right and I must be wrong. If I had pushed a little bit on the logic, wait a second, how is it that houses that are out of whack and mortgages that people can't afford um, are gonna be okay when you turn them into a financial product? If I had pushed on that, I would have provided better coverage. And I think there are versions of that with COVID and everything else in which I would just urge journalists, yes, there are things that are counterintuitive in the world. Logic can lead you astray but it's about the best tool that you have. And don't simply defer to someone because they are an expert. Ask, okay, I, how I, is I, it you know that? I want to um, add a plus one to that um, very strongly. Before I get into a point about that in a second, um, in a few minutes, we're gonna field audience questions if you have. So please uh, start sending them in into the Q&A box and then I'll, I'll see them and send them to Wafa and David. Um, you know, there's a landmark uh, Supreme Court case from 40 years ago or something called uh, Daubert v. Merrill Phar Pharmaceuticals. I'm hoping there are no lawyers listening because I'm going to sort of mangle this, but it was about expert witnesses and use of expertise in legal cases. And kind of the old system was, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd have an expert witness and you'd say, Wafa, how many PhDs do you have? And Wafa would say, I have four PhDs. So who's, who do you think is right? Well, I think one side is right. Okay case dismissed. And what this case did was say, and then David would be the expert witness for the other side, and he only had three mm -hmm. PhDs. So, um, and, 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 and it was that you're not allowed to base a, 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 an epistemological claim in a legal case on the resume of the person making the claim. You had to base it on the logic of the evidence they were presenting and unpack that. I think there's a version of the Daubert standard for journalists that doesn't come naturally to many of us, but really needs to be um, elevated in, in the journalistic canon. Um, one of the people in journalism who's really won battle stars during this um, is my colleague, new colleague at Columbia Journalism School, Zainab Tufeki. Um, and, and Zainab is not a trained journalist. She's a sociologist. Uh, who has been in the sociology department um, at the University of North Carolina. Um, and, you know, her secret in, to me as a great admirer of her coverage is she unpacks and takes apart uh, the expert discourse. She has the confidence to do that. So um, rather than saying, I'm going to call experts and ask them a couple of questions to be put to me in lay terms, she says, what's the study design? What's the finding? What's the strength of the finding? Um, those kinds of questions. Um, and she's done a spectacular job, often just dealing with things that's public information, but being able to interrogate it in a more robust way than journalists usually can. Um, so if journalists can teach themselves or be taught how to do that with more confidence, how not to look at a journal article that they find on Google Scholar or whatever and, you know, tremble in fear, but instead say, I, I believe I can understand this and kind of take it apart. Um, that would be a big step, not uh, just for pandemic. Sorry, Nick, just to throw in one thing about Zainab, whose work I enormously admire. Um, I saw on Twitter and it was something in responses. So I'm guessing a ton of people may not have seen it. She was sort of thinking out loud, having a little bit of a debate, very respectful on Twitter on a substantive matter. And someone who she disagreed with 
another person kind of piled on and 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 made fun of the other person's qualifications. Mm-hmm. Like this mm-hmm. person isn't even a virologist. Yeah, yeah, and right. Zainab, to her great credit, said, no, 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 no. Like we're not, right? We're not gonna litigate this um, by mm-hmm. sort of, even though she was defending the person she disagreed with, we're not gonna litigate this, you know, by, by comparing PhDs. Um, and it's hard because experts really do know more than non-experts, right? But experts also disagree with each other and journalists have a role, not in pretending we know as much about epidemiology as epidemiologists, we do not, but understanding that we can query their knowledge. We can weigh the arguments that different, that people are, are making. So, so I think I, I, just to add, I, mean, I don't think this is an attribute that only journalists need to have. I mean, I think this is something that clearly in, in you know, when I talk to my students or when I talk to my own staff, my own colleagues, this this whole need to question um, and not to read an article like you were saying, Nick, and say it's, you know, and read it superficially and read the conclusions and say, these are great scientists and they found this, but to be able to actually deepen the understanding, question, um, identify the gaps and, and so on is, is, is equally important for, uh, in, in my world as well. And it's not a ubiquitous um, uh, attribute that people have. There are lots of people who are in public health or in medicine who, who don't really pursue this, uh, this important aspect of, uh, of trying to dig behind the, um, uh, the story, you know, and try to really understand what is the logic, what is the evidence, is the evidence there to support the conclusions and so on. So I think there's a need across the board for us to um, to do this more and to also teach people how to do it better. I want to go back to the pandemic uh, and be a little kind of forensic for, for a few minutes and just say from the standpoint of now, um, what did the U.S. and the world do right and do wrong? We're completely using shamelessly the power of hindsight here, um, but how how was um, how was the performance of the United States and other countries and you know global organizations in dealing with this pandemic? Were there things that could have been done that would have made it less severe, for example? I mean, I can start, and then David, uh, you can add. Uh, I feel. Uh... Most importantly, of course, we were not prepared. I mean, I think that's, um, I mean, there's been a huge amount of investments in preparedness, quote unquote, preparedness, uh, funding for preparedness, uh, investments in preparedness for years and years, particularly after 9-11 in the United States. And you kind of wonder uh, how can this have happened? And there've been uh, a lot of exercises and tabletop exercises on being, you know, how do we prepare for a pandemic, how do we prepare for a major accident, and so on. And it's, um, it's clear to me that that really did not work. I mean, I think that uh, uh, we were not prepared in any way, uh, whether it be in terms of, uh, of uh, the population being prepared for something like this, whether it's public health investment, or whether it be in terms of our health system, our health care structure, um, uh, stockpiling of uh, PPEs, I mean, across the board, we just were not prepared. We had the, we had the belief and the appearance that we were, but we were not. I mean, I think that's number one. I think, in, in, and then the, the second um, is that, um, is obviously that we, uh, this from day one, there was a politicization of, uh, of this pandemic from day one in terms of, you know, what is the voice uh, what was the voice that was talking to the people in this country? And it was, it was kind of more of a, you know, the, the, polit- the political voice rather than a public health voice. Um, there was, a, or there were many voices, and this led to confusion, mistrust, um, led to divisions between the pe- pe- between people rather than trying to bring people at a moment of crisis. Um, so I think that that really doomed the response. I believe. Um, and, and has doomed and, and continues to plague us to this point with vaccine hesitancy and, and so on, um, in, at least in the United States. Um, and I think the undermining of, of, of institutions, whether it be uh, CDC or public health or other institutions has also been uh, 
uh, really um, a huge, uh, you know, um, detriment uh, to all of us. Um, and it will 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 be a durable, um, will have a durable impact as well. I mean, in terms of things that have been done well, I believe that um, there's been a, an openness to sharing of scientific data and sharing of uh, scientific information. And this across the board, whether it's uh, sharing information about the structure of the virus itself, uh, sharing information in terms of how to treat patients with COVID-19. Uh, I recall early on, there were conference calls between physicians, uh, we here in the United States and people in China or in Italy who were kind of experiencing the pandemic ahead of us and that openness to sharing this kind of information is really was very important and remains very important. And then of course the great success is getting the vaccines in a, in a short period of time. I think that's, that's a huge success. And, uh, but unfortunately, again, we do have the failure of not thinking of vaccines for the world, thinking of vaccine in much more of a national uh, kind of a, a nationalistic kind of a more of a framework. And those are just some thoughts. David? The, the failure to vaccinate the world um, more quickly is particularly striking when you look at the numbers. I mean, the cost is just, it's not just cost, there are logistics, but it's just not, um, these are not huge sums, right? Um, lifting the entire world out of poverty would be extremely expensive. Um, vaccinating the entire world would not be. Um, uh, so I think um, uh, I think in terms of what we did poorly, um, uh, I think that look the obvious thing is that is um, not absolutely every part of the Trump administration, but the Trump administration handled the pandemic uh, extremely poorly. Um, and you contrast that to how both of the previous two presidents, George W. Bush and Barack Obama, handled crises. Um, they obviously both made mistakes. But you look at, um, you know, George W. Bush read the history of the 1918, personally read the history of the 1918 um, uh, pandemic flu pandemic, I believe on a vacation, and then ordered the federal government to start taking pandemic planning much more seriously. Um, uh, Obama uh, had a very good record um, in, in battling um, uh, contagious diseases. Uh, you look at how those two administrations worked together um, in 2008 and 2009 to fight the financial crisis um, and prevent it from turning into another Great Depression. And then you look at how Donald Trump didn't at all seem interested in facts. Um, he repeatedly lied about how bad it was or how bad it would be. And, and, it, and that cost lives. Um, and it'll be a permanent stain uh, on his record as president. And, and I think seeing what we saw about the election, it probably cost him re-election um, as well. Um, I think that um, uh, none of these are going to be on the same, quite on the same scale. Um, but uh, I think that, I do think experts, uh, Wafa, to your point that it's not just journalists who should use logic. I do think experts underused logic early on. I mean, if you go back and look at what a lot of experts were saying about masks, you don't need a mask. A lot of that was because there wasn't a study that said masks protect you from COVID. But we shouldn't have needed a study to have a reasonable belief that, that masks might help. I mean, anyone who's traveled in Asia, as I have, knows that the notion that masks can protect you from contagious diseases is a widely held notion. And there's logical reason to think it's correct. And yet we had um, uh, experts in this country, including experts I admire, say basically for a while saying, you know, no, no, you don't need a mask. And I, I think they should have been a little bit more humble um, and a little bit more willing to say, actually, that there's good reason to think masks may help. I think in other countries, um, there were other rich countries um, that did quite a good job in preventing the spread. I think Australia, I think Eastern Canada, um, I think Japan. And I, I, to me, one of the things that I've learned and have, have heard from, from some public health experts is we should take more seriously the idea that, that truly strict travel um, uh, restrictions, not Trump's ban on travel from China, which wasn't even a ban because Americans could come home from China, but truly strict um, travel bans really can have an effect. I mean, countries in Africa, in Asia, Australia, Eastern can provinces in Canada, the Atlantic provinces in Canada, it really seemed to make a difference. Um, and and um, I know people are very reluctant to, to recommend travel restrictions. They have bad effects on the economy. Um, they can seem nativist, but they really did work in a wide variety of countries. Um, uh, and then in terms of well and poorly, um, 
I think we've seen both um, England and Israel um, and the United States handle vaccine distribution very well. Um, uh, and then I think we've seen much of Europe and Japan and Australia and Canada um, uh, sometimes worry too much about the details, worry about what price they were paying for the vaccine in Europe, worrying about, you know, is it going to get distributed exactly equally to different countries? No, just get the vaccine, get shots in arms, um, and that will end up saving many more lives than, than getting the perfect process. Um, let me take a little side trip um, at but some of this is is implicit. Some of these questions are implicit in what you all have been talking about. Um, and, and ask Wafa, if you can talk about what it was like to be involved in um, uh, planning the pandemic response of a single very large institution, namely Columbia University, um, where I'm guessing slightly from the outside that, that the luxury of saying, well, we're just going to shut everything down for two years and play it safe was not attractive <laughs> or, or, or really presented its own challenges. So how did that process work? It seems like it's been quite successful, but can you talk about that somewhat? Yeah, I can. Um, and I think the story's not finished, <laughs> you know, obviously. So I think we'll need to do kind of a post-mortem and see where we were successful and where we were not successful. I mean, I already think of some things that we could have done differently, but um, I think part of it is, I think uh, that from the beginning, uh, uh, the Lee Bollinger, who's the president of the university and uh, established a, a, a task force. So there was one kind of unified task force that was established and, and led by the interim provost and uh, Ira Katznelson. And, um, and, uh, and having, a, um, and I have had have the pleasure of serving as I lead the public health group for that task force. And I think what was incredibly useful uh, was that there were, uh, the group included individuals coming from a variety of different parts of the university representing a variety of different constituencies within uh, of the university, including the whole, the student aspects, the, um, uh, the faculty, the staff, the uh, financial issues, the uh, you know housing facilities, and so on. So, bringing together a group of leadership um, at high level that met on a very regular basis, often three times a week when we started to tackle some of the issues and make decisions, uh, that was incredibly useful. And I think to speak with one voice and to have the that voice be amplified by the leadership of the university was very valuable. The other was. I think from day one, uh, and, you know, again, thankfully as a university, uh, we, there was of course the decision to really stick to the evidence and, uh, and be very much driven by the evidence and, and anchor the decisions in evidence. That was, and that was not always easy because there were, there were moments of uncertainty, as you were saying, David, uh, where you could, see, you, could, you, know, you could go either way. And I think thirdly is, um, is the decision to kind of, as, as many of you are aware, universities are very decentralized. They're different schools, different institutes, um, different campuses. Um, so there are lots of voices and lots of, uh, of, uh, of entities. And I think another important decision that I think helped us is to have a unified approach. So we had a unified approach, uniform approach to testing. We have a which is a university testing program. We also have a uni unified approach to vaccination, for example. Uh, we have one approach to all the other measures um, that, um, that need to be put in place, whether it's related to you know, uh, masking or distancing or other aspects. So I think what's been helpful is having these kinds of, um, of, um, of universal kind of accepted approaches rather than you know, breaking into different pieces, everybody doing their own thing. There's always a risk of, of this happening. And I think that was very helpful that that did not happen. And I think lastly is communication. I think, and I don't know how successful we were or not, uh, uh, Nick, and maybe you can comment on this uh, in terms of uh, uh, having all the information on the website, having uh, multiple, multiple webinars, uh, offering people the opportunity to ask questions, and so on, I think that also was helpful in, uh, uh, I always say communication, communication, communication is really the, the fundamental uh, uh, 
uh, is of fundamental importance in times of a crisis, uh, including a pandemic. It, it's, I would add one thing, I, I agree with everything you said, which is, and you know, this has to do with being a rich university, I suppose, but Columbia was clearly trying to impose as little pain as possible on the community in terms of, you know, income loss, job loss, things like that. And, and I think that builds trust. Um, uh, as soon as people are, are being personally put in pain, they become sour, mistrustful, and, and the, the community spirit deteriorates. Now, as again, Columbia has the luxury of being able to do that, but, but that was some of what was going on nationally. Um, I wanna pivot and, and talk about the future, um, both in a public health sense and in a journalism sense. So we can start with either one, um, but it's kind of about, um, <laughs> to be crude, when's the next pandemic and uh, what does it look like and what should we do to get ready for it? Both, both in the, again, public health sense and governance of the country sense and, and of the world, and also what should news organizations do? So um, I need to apologize for the barking dog in the background. I'll let Wafa go first. I'm not at my house. Well, I think there's um, uh, looking ahead, I, I'm always, um, obviously is how do we continue to tackle the current pandemic, but also how to avoid making the same mistakes in the future. And um, I, I fear, and I've seen it's happened before, is that once a crisis is gone, there's um, often attention moves to the next crisis, you know, and just the, the light moves from shining, the shining the light on this issue to moving on to the next. And I think that's a risk for everybody, including for obviously for journalism as well, is moving is you know leaving that story and moving on to the next story, and and that's a great fear um, that I certainly have, and I've seen it before. You take your eyes off uh, tuberculosis in the United States, and you move on to something else, and guess what? Infrastructure collapses, then we get outbreaks of of uh, of TB and and so on. So. How do we sustain the, the commitment is and, and to get people to remember this and, and, and sort of really appreciate that there will be another pandemic and we cannot make the same mistakes again and we need to continue to invest between crises um, so as to avoid the horrible loss of life that was unnecessary uh, in this pandemic. And this means um, a continued, I think, a continued investment in, in public health, uh, very, very important. Uh, often people don't appreciate what public health does. Uh, very hard to explain what it does, but hopefully there's a deeper appreciation now and continued investment uh, in public health in our, in our, and in our public health entities, um, uh, you know, whether they be at the local or, or national level. Uh, local health departments in some states have like two to staff members, believe it or not, you know, it's a, it's really is a crisis. And then I think is is continuing to uh, to innovate and um, and to um, build on the private public partnerships that were developed to tackle this pandemic. I think would be very important moving forward uh, to continue that process of innovation. And again, rather than again dispersing and everybody does what they. What they do best, and and lastly is is we need the people uh, to be um, to build on this what I call public health literacy to to maintain this knowledge and and interest and so on in the future even at even between crises. I think that's a challenge for all of us that communicate about health uh, or about pandemics, uh, and clearly that's where the partnerships with those who communicate like journalism is, is so fundamental. David, I um, I guess I'll take a little bit on the on the near term. Um, I I think it's going to be. Uh, I agree with everything about the long term. It, there will be future pandemics. It's important for us to cover that. It's important for us to write about 
universal coronavirus vaccines. Um, uh, journalists can shape priorities by writing about these things. Um, uh, and we've now clearly been awakened to the danger of pandemics. Um, uh, what I'm about to say runs in the other direction, but I, it's important to emphasize that um, uh, we should be covering the risk of pandemic more uh, even when this ends than, than we have over the last couple of decades. I, I do think, and this relates to this question of do we have a bad news bias? I do think it's important um, that we figure out how to write about extremely low risks that are still not zero risks. Um, and I think that's a real challenge right now. Um, uh, and that brings, that, that relates to school. Um, I mean, the risk of a child dying of COVID is not zero. Um, it is extremely low. Right. It, it, by all measures, it seems to be lower than, than the risks that um, parents accept when they allow their children to travel in an automobile. Um, so how do we deal with that? And, and we in the media play an important role there. What do we choose to write about and how do we write about it? And if we, because COVID is so top of mind, if we treat any COVID risk as the dominant risk in our society, we risk contributing to uh, a panic in which um, people decide, well, schools can't open. Um, and, um, and so we don't want to ignore the low risks um, that exist from COVID for vaccinated people or from, from kids. But it's really important to think about the other costs, the, the cost of the lost learning that kids have suffered, the costs of loneliness. Um, uh, I know that for many people, masks have virtually no cost, but they don't have virtually no cost for everyone. If you are hard of hearing, masks um, are a real imposition. Um, if you are a child with learning disabilities, masks are a real imposition. Um, if you are a very young child trying to learn how to socialize and read faces, masks are some level of imposition. And so I think it's important for us um, uh, not to just treat everything as um, minimizing the COVID danger is always the right thing to do. It's not always the right thing to do. Um, the same way we drive in cars, even though they have big costs, um, uh, we're going to have to do some things that, um, that increase COVID risk, even though they have costs. Yeah, and, and, you know, the, the school question gets in some ways more natural nuance than the economics versus health question. Mm -hmm. which, um, uh, you know, where the, the natural in, impulse of journalists is to say, I, it's just very hard to feel empathy for a small business owner who's going to go out of business um, when it would entail some degree of increased health risk. There's a tendency to say, let's, you know, go all the way there. And honestly, I don't know if, <laughs> if you all agree with me that, you know, the famous 700 public health experts that the Times surveys occasionally. I mean, they're really cautious people, you know? Um, and and uh, it's sometimes I thought they're, even though there's public health professionals and I'm not, that they're, they're being a little extreme in sort of solving for one variable in a complex multivariate e equation. Um, I'm going to read a question I've gotten, and we're getting to our last few minutes, so I just urge people to send in more questions. Um, this would be, I guess, primarily for David, and it's should the New York Times and other, you know, outstanding news organizations uh, prioritize as a response to what we've lived through in the last year and a half or so, uh, long-form journalism or uh, assigning people to go deep on, on and long on a subject and stay with it for a long time? Um, should that be a, a sort of redeployment of resources? It's certainly a very important part of what we do at the Times. We allow people to develop expertise. Um, well, well, let me take it in a few different parts. Uh, long form is important, and there's a big audience for it. It's, it's actually reassuring when we do long form well. Um, uh, huge numbers of people read it. Um, I mean, the story we just ran about um, climate change in Chicago 
um, I highlighted it in, in the newsletter. And so I went and I checked to see how many people were reading it. It was phenomenal. I mean, it was, I mean, the audience for that piece was massive and that was a long piece. Um, so people will read things. I, I, I think that long form to me is not the highest goal that we have. It, it is a wonderful and important part of journalism. Um, but we also need to invest in journalists who develop expertise and who are writing all the time. Right. So it's also important to employ people who know about criminal justice um, and who are writing about it every week, in addition to employing someone who can write a fantastic magazine story like my friend Emily Bazelon um, that you, she couldn't do if she were writing about it every single week. But we also need the people who write about it every week. And so long form is great. Is it's, it's vital. It's not sufficient. Um, uh, and we come out every day and people, we're not an academic journal or a monthly, and people rely on us to tell them about what's going on in the world every day. And so we have to make sure we also invest in people who are, who are doing frequent form in addition to long form. Wafa, do you have anything you want to add on that? In terms of the, the journalism how, piece? Yeah, how, what journalists should do. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think you need to have the mix. Like you said, uh, David, um, I do think um, uh, built based on the experience of the um, uh, of this pandemic, uh, I can see the expertise that's um, that's grown over the months, having conversations with some journalists over time repeatedly is uh, um, I can see that there's a depth of knowledge that's uh, pretty remarkable that has been built very, um, very quickly, and also a depth of analysis, ability to analyze data and do the kind of, uh, of questioning um, that you just described that's so important and, and sustaining and maintaining that, that beat is, is important because like I said, again, um, we're going to need that if, in order to maintain the interest and the commitment, this preparedness idea for the future and having these voices be, uh, have the opportunity to continue to write about this is, is going to be incredibly valuable um, at the same, uh, you know, at the same time. Um, so that's, a, that would be my sense. Yep. I got a request for sort of a clarification from David. Um, I don't know if, can you see this in the chat, David? Uh, or if not, I'll read it to you. Um, he, this person says, are you talking about going beyond the news cycle uh, as, a, as a value in journalism, being sort of longer term committed to things uh, rather than covering things as they're happening and then moving on to something else? I hope I'm restating that properly. Yeah, that, I mean, we should make decisions. What are the, pandemic's a great example, right? What's something that isn't going to be um, necessarily in the news tomorrow, but that we need to invest in, right? Um, the Times has a, uh, I mean, in some ways, it's what made the Times the Times, its willingness to invest in journalism, even during downtimes. The Times is not the leading newspaper of New York. Um, uh, and during, um, during World War II, the Times decided to invest more in coverage um, than other papers, um, and, and it made a difference. So we have a long record of doing that. We don't always do so well as, as figuring out what stories deserve investment that are less obvious, right? Um, and so sadly, climate change is now an obvious story um, uh, because of fires and extreme heat, but stories that aren't necessarily in the news, no one's making an announcement. But basically deciding, um, we've always had reporters who cover contagious diseases. Have we had enough? Probably not. And so I think it's important um, that, that, we, that we do that. I was simply distinguishing that we wanna have, we wanna understand that we need a mix of people who do um, the, the 10,000 word story that you can do only by spending months on it and almost nothing else. And then we also want, the people, um, you know, like Adam Liptak, who is going to write all the time, and you can rely on him to tell you what's going on in the Supreme Court. Um, let me go back to uh, this next pandemic question, but I'll start with past pandemics. Well, you know, many one reason that the, the the handling of this one wasn't as good as it should have been, I think, was that. Uh, people got used to reading about pandemics 
and then not having a big U.S. consequence, you know, SARS and, and MERS and so on. Um, so, Wafa, could you sort of explain that? Was that because we handled previous instances incredibly well, or we just got lucky in the past? Yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. And whenever I give a talk about COVID-19, it's always, I point out is that when you look at a map of where the cumulative numbers of cases, guess which country has the most is the United States, uh, and most you know cases, and as well as in Western Europe. So it's kind of a pandemic that's affected mainly the global North, as we say, or, um, and, and not the global South, where usually uh, people associate bad things happening there. <laughs> You know, so uh, so that's very different um, uh, aspect of this pandemic, and I think that's a, hopefully that's also going to make this uh, because of the pain and suffering and the experiences that everybody's gone through in our country um, uh, be uh, more willing, I think, to think about the future and take future threats of pandemics more seriously. I think we we you know we do have. A, um, we've been lucky to some extent, but also it's the nature of the pathogen, you know, the, or, the, the, the virus or the organism that's causing uh, uh, the, the disease that's also sometimes plays in our favor, like Ebola, for example. Uh, even though we've had a few cases of Ebola here come to our country, they were not, there was no further transmission because we do have, you know, largely a stronger uh, infection control uh, systems, we have ways of containment, you know, we have the resources to be able to do that and can contain quickly um, a, a virus that's transmitted by touch, by touching blood and body fluids. It gets a lot trickier when you have a virus that's transmitted casually so easily, uh, like SARS-CoV-2. Uh, and that's where, again, the um, uh, we, we were not able to move rapidly and pivot to be able to put in place rapidly all the measures. I think David mentioned the masking, the, uh, the, the limitation on movement of people, whether it be travel between countries or within countries or within cities. We were hesitant to do that. And I think we, because of economic reasons, because of political reasons, and I think that's where uh, we, we failed initially to be able to make those, those tough decisions. Um, SARS, SARS, the original SARS virus was not as transmissible as this virus, uh, for example. And that's why, again, it was able to be contained uh, to largely transmission within uh, healthcare facilities rather than in the community. So it's the nature of that virus itself, uh, the disease itself, how it's transmitted, how easily transmitted, as also and also our willingness to make those tough, decisive uh, steps to abruptly stop transmission. We're getting near the end, so I'm going to ask you both uh, individually a sort of a quasi trick question. Um, so Wafa, if you were suddenly appointed the editor of the New York Times, uh, what policies would you put in place at the New York Times in light of the pandemic experience? And David, if you were appointed head of the CDC, uh, what policies would you put in place um, in light of the pandemic experience? Who wants to go first? Go ahead, David. I... <laughs> Fair enough. Um, uh, I think, um, uh, and the, uh, there'll be a little bit of repetition here. Um, I, I do think I would push people, um, if I worked at the CDC, to try to get out of this idea of the answer is always in this is in the perfectly designed study. And I'm exaggerating only slightly there for effect, but the mask story makes clear that 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 there is a real problem there, right? Which is, and we saw it again um, over the course of this year when I thought the CDC was extremely slow. Um, to react um, to the, all the evidence we had on vaccinations and continued to you know, urge outdoor masking for kids and, um, and outdoor masking for vaccinated people. Um, and so I, I guess I would urge the CDC to try to look broadly at the evidence um, and not think that, that there's always gonna be one study that's gonna give a perfect answer. And I have to say, I was listening, I recently listening to a podcast um, in which Andy Slavitt, a former Biden administration official, was interviewing Dr. Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC. 
And I was deeply impressed by the way she talked about the question of whether someone who has had uh, the J&J vaccine, which is a single shot, should get a, a basically a booster from one of the other vaccines. She did not treat it as a black and white question. She basically said, look, um, we don't have all the evidence. Um, uh, um, there is, we don't know. There is some reason to think that this could be helpful based on what we've seen in England from AstraZeneca, which is similar to Johnson & Johnson. Um, if you decide to do it, you're taking some risk, but I understand why people are curious. I felt like she was treating the public like adults. Um, uh, and, and, and then I may be misremembering the phrasing slightly, but I think Andy Slavitt said, you're saying that you wouldn't throw yourself in front of the train to present, prevent someone from getting um, a, a Pfizer or a Moderna if they've already had J&J. &J. And she said, that's right. And then he specifically distinguished it between how she would react to someone who had decided to get only one Pfizer or Moderna. And she basically said, that is a mistake. Right. And so I think that kind of approach from the CDC, where you where you give the American people um, uh, the information you have and you use your expertise, but you don't pretend that everything has a nice, tidy answer and you don't pretend that you always have to wait until there's the perfect study to say anything. I just think is a better approach for the CDC and would have led to better guidance on masking on both ends. Earlier urging to wear them and, and sooner realism about when people could take them off. Okay, Wafa. Uh, yeah, uh, that's a, a tough question, but um, I mean, I think in, uh, we touched on this before, is I, I do think the um, importance of keeping some, the story alive um, and, um, and, and thinking ahead and anticipating the next, um, uh, where are we gonna be at, the trajectory, the narrative and how the narrative is changing over time and being uh, willing to, Kind of take one step ahead of what, where the story is today uh, to be able to um, uh, write the, 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 the narrative of the future and in a way also help inform people overall in terms of what to expect and what they need to be prepared for and so on and as well as the and 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 putting in the resources to enable that to happen on an ongoing basis is, is very important uh, if we are to to really think seriously about how we think of pandemics as something other than episodic crises. I think now we think of them as episodic crises and uh, we want to think of them as an ongoing crisis that's going to kind of flare up every now and then, but, uh, but it is, it's, it's, it's not just episodic crisis. Sort of along the lines now we think about climate change. We don't think it's just a crisis of today. It's a crisis that we have to to invest in and communicate about in the future. I do think the other side, the other issue is that, that what we touched on is this expert voice. Uh, and I realize I'm called upon sometimes to be an expert voice and, and really to think, you know, rather than having the one expert says this and try to bring a voice that says the opposite in every story, uh, which is sometimes what you see uh, but more in terms of really digging into the why is why is somebody saying what they're saying rather than a quote, you know, is mm -hmm. why are they saying what they're saying? Can they explain why they're saying what they're saying uh, so that we can actually, so it can be a more compelling, compelling, uh, compelling narrative, uh, I think would be an important thing to invest in as well. Okay, well, we're at 329, so I think we better stop. Um, thanks to both of you and thanks to everyone who came and thanks to the Russell Sage Foundation for putting this on. Um, this has been wonderful. And uh, again, we will be back uh, tomorrow at the same time on a different issue, which is race in America. So if anybody wants to come back for that, uh, please do. Thanks everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>